Well, let's uh, take our Bibles this evening and uh, turn to Matthew, uh, Matthew, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5. Uh, we began last week a, uh, a new series uh, that I believe is going to be a help to us. Uh, you say, well, why do you say that? I'm not saying that because I'm preaching. I'm saying that because we're going to read the greatest sermon given by the greatest preacher that ever lived. And that's the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, Jesus Christ himself delivered this uh, powerful sermon. And um, uh, we're going to begin, if you would, the first section uh, of the Sermon on the Mount. If you look at the entirety of the sermon, is found from chapter 5 all the way to chapter 7. And uh, different people have uh, kind of uh, put them in different sections. But the first section we're going to deal with is what we refer to and people have called the Beatitudes. Um, we're going to, uh, just for context, say go back to verse 1, but we're going to deal primarily with verse 3, but I want us to read down to verse 12. Okay, now notice here, Matthew chapter 5, verse number 1. The Bible says, And seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Now notice here as we look at this passage, it doesn't seem to be, uh, I think just on the surface, something that would kind of make us happy, does it? <laughs> Uh, he says in verse 11 and 12, he says, uh, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake, he says, rejoice and be exceeding glad. It seems to be kind of contradictory. Uh, but here again, the Sermon on the Mount, just by way of refresher from last week, we know that Jesus Christ here is primarily addressing His disciples. Uh, the scene here, the Bible says in verse 1 that he seeing the multitude. And if we study chapter 4, he went all over. Uh, there's people again that came from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond Jordan. Uh, so in some areas are beyond 100 miles away. And they didn't have subways back then and planes, okay? Uh, they either went on foot or on a donkey. And so we see here that uh, there's people all over the land that come to hear Jesus Christ and see. He sees the multitude and we think, well, go heal them. There's some people that are diseased. There's some people that are possessed with demons. And, but what does he do? The Bible says he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And so notice he's kind of has set him apart a little bit from the multitude. The disciples come to him, and the Bible says, And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, The message of the Sermon on the Mount, I believe is very important, is for believers. It's not for anybody. In other words, the Sermon on the Mount is not the standard that Jesus Christ expects everybody to live by. Because everybody cannot live that way. It is particularly for the believers. Now we talked about last week how this is really as Jesus Christ is uh, turning away from the multitude and calling His disciples unto Him to really discipleship. Uh, we understand that it is our, uh, all of our call to be, to be disciples of Christ. Now discipleship is, is a clear part of the Great Commission. In other words, the Bible says we're supposed to teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. So making disciples, teaching people disciples, uh, uh, teaching disciples is a clear part of the Great Commission. Now, the word disciple means this, and I'm 
kind of, uh, again, putting the uh, definition again before us, before we go into deal with these Beatitudes, the word disciple means this, it means a learner, a pupil, uh, but more important, it's not just someone that hears something, it is someone that adheres to the teaching. So it's not just someone that hears as, uh, you know, everybody's been in school and everybody's sat in, in school listening to the teacher. Some people, everybody hears, <laughs> but not everybody adheres. Uh, and that's important here because as we think about being a disciple of Christ, it's not just about hearing the truth, it's about adhering to the truth. Now, the word disciple must be connected with the word discipline. That's important. Uh, we asked three questions last week, and I'll say those again. Number one, do we care about being a disciple? Number two, are we willing to take the time to be a disciple? Because if we uh, say, well, yeah, I want to be a disciple, I, I want to be discipled by Christ, uh, we have to understand that it's going to take a lot of discipline and a lot of work. Are we willing to take the time? And number three is, are we ready to think on a different level than this world thinks? Because if you look at the Beatitudes, that's exactly what it is. Jesus Christ is presenting a way He wants the disciples to live that is totally different than how the world functions. Now again, when we think about being a disciple, we have to understand again that the ministry of Jesus Christ was primarily, although He preached in the synagogue, He healed many people, His primary ministry, what you see that He did most of the time was disciple. His disciples. He discipled the twelve. He discipled the seventy. Those that follow him, he discipled them. He prepared them. And so he, again, if Christ emphasized that, it has to be emphasized in our lives as well uh, for us to be discipled by Christ. When someone is taught by someone else or discipled, they become a reflection of the one who did the teaching. Uh, when I uh, played basketball, uh, I would be a reflection of whoever taught me how to play basketball. Uh, sometimes you look at someone, well, he shoots like his father. Or someone uh, says if they've been trained in singing or instrument, or he plays like this person. You think of Bible call, I mentioned this last week, but you can tell someone sometimes when someone preaches, you say, oh, he graduated from that school because he makes me think about that person, okay? Someone influenced someone discipled, and that person is a reflection of the one who did the teaching. That is our goal, isn't it? Uh, our goal is to be like Christ. Therefore, by allowing Christ to disciple us, then we will become like Him. Uh, His reflection will be in our lives, and that's exactly what we want. Now again, I want you to notice here in verse 3, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Jesus Christ is talking about something that is totally different than this world. In other words, we talked about how last week, in other words, the philosophy of Christ is different than the philosophy of the world. In other words, the kingdoms of this world are measured by two things. The kingdoms of this world are measured by what they possess and about what they do. Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, the United States of America is the greatest country in the world because of what it possesses and because of what it can do. In other words, there is no other nation in the world that, that is as prosperous as the United States of America. And people measure the greatness of our country because of what it possesses, but also because of what it can do. In other words, the military power. People will think twice before declaring war against the United States of America. Why? Because of what it can do. Now, the kingdoms of this world are measured by what they possess and by what they can do. Individuals are measured that way. Well, let's look at what you have. And let's look at what you can do. Uh, but the... A kingdom of Christ is measured not by what we possess and about what we do, but it is measured by what we are. And the emphasis here of the Sermon on the Mount is exactly on that. The kingdom of Christ is different than the kingdom of this world because it is measured by what we are and not by what we possess and what we do. Now we come here to this place here, uh, really the beginning of the sermon. In the first sentence of the sermon, Jesus Christ speaks and He opens His mouth. And these are the first words out of His mouth, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now let's, on the surface, blessed 
are the poor in spirit? That kind of sounds depressing, doesn't it? Uh, if you just kind of look at it on the surface, you think, well, that's not really what we were expecting as the first words of Christ. <laughs> you know, uh, at times when Jesus Christ spoke, His first words were peace. We like that. But here His first words are this. This is how, think about it, this is how He begins the sermon. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want to deal with three things this, this evening as we look into this message. First of all, I want us to see the intent of this verse, the instruction of the verse, and thirdly, the importance of this verse. Notice, first of all, the intent of this verse. He says again, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, a basic meaning of the word blessed is this, happy. If there was one word that someone could attach to the word blessed, they would put happy or happiness. That's what the word literally means. You know, we refer to the first section of the Sermon on the Mount as the Beatitudes. Well, the word beatitude means this. It means happiness and blessedness. That's what the word means. You know, we can say the Beatitudes are those attitudes that should be in us. Be attitudes, okay? Those are the attitudes that should be in us. That's a simple definition. The Beatitudes is simply this. It is a list of recipes which, when followed, produce God's blessing in our life. There is a misunderstanding today as to the meaning of blessing. Uh, you know, sometimes we use that phrase quite a bit. God bless you. Well, what does that mean? Oh, what do we mean by that? What's the meaning behind that? You know, being blessed uh, does not mean that there is a, a supernatural force field that will prevent bad things from ever happening to us. That's not what it means. Sometimes we say, God bless you, and sometimes we think, well, that's kind of a good luck charm. Uh, that means that if uh, someone blesses me, then nothing bad is going to happen to me. Is that what that means? Well, I don't think so because of Job. Uh, do you remember Job in Job chapter 1, verse 10? Uh, God said to Satan, Hast thou uh, made an hedge, or Satan says to God, Hast not thou made an hedge about him, and about his house, and about all that he hath and on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. Now think about it this way. Job obviously was blessed of God, yet the devil was still able to bring pain and suffering in his life. He was blessed of God, but the blessing of God does not mean... No bad thing happening to you. That's important. As a matter of fact, Job was still blessed of God when going through the trial. The, this blessedness that we're talking about, being blessed, is not a promise. It is not a promise of health and wealth. That's not what it is. Uh, a lot of times the prosperity preachers say this, Give your life to Jesus and God will bless your life and you'll be rich and all your problems will go away. That's just a lie. And by the way, that is not what this term blessed means. It does not mean health and wealth. The blessing of God can be health and wealth. It can be, but it is not necessarily or automatically so. Uh, that's very important. Christ, think about it, Christ spent His time on earth with very little money. As a matter of fact, He's described as poor, lowly. The Apostle Paul, think about it, was a very sick man, yet he was greatly blessed of God. Uh, he asked for uh, the physical ailment that he had to be removed, and God said, I'm not going to remove it, but yet he was still blessed of God. Uh, you see, blessing has nothing to do with health or wealth, as many people think today. It is vitally important to place our understanding of blessing in its proper relation to the rest of the Scriptures. Now, when we look at individuals such as Abraham, God blessed Abraham with health and wealth because he obeyed him. So that's a possibility, but it's not automatically. Uh, think about it, Matthew chapter 5. Notice verse 10. If, if blessing were equated to health and wealth, notice what he says in verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall uh, say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake." whoa, so you mean that we can be blessed and yet persecuted? Yes, that's right. You mean we can be blessed and, and people can revile us? Yes, that's what he says. In other words, everything can be going wrong in your life and in my life while still being blessed of God. 
As I mentioned last week, this idea of blessed is not in the sense that happiness is related to circumstances, but in the sense that joy is not related to circumstances at all. That's what this idea of blessed means. Blessed is the favor of God being poured out on us. Psalm 512 says this, For thou, Lord, will bless the righteous, with favor wilt thou compass him with a, as with a shield. So again, the word blessed means happy. A simple definition means happy, happiness. Not in the sense of happiness in rela- that's related to circumstances, but in the sense that joy is not related to circumstances at all. So this, is again, is the intent of the Beatitudes. God wants us to be happy. God wants us, think about it, wait a minute, poor in spirit, mourn, meek, hunger and thirst after righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, uh, persecuted, reviled, yes, blessed, happy, having the favor of God. That's the intent of those Beatitudes. This is a total different economy. Do we understand that? This is contrary to everything that this world teaches. But that's what Jesus said. So, that's the intent of this verse. But number two, I want us to look at the instruction of this verse. He says this, Blessed are, notice, the poor in spirit. Now, <laughs> I'm going to deal with three questions here this, that's four, three questions this evening. First of all, I want to ask this question, or answer this question, what is not being poor in spirit? Because there's a lot of confusion about uh, being poor in spirit. Uh, So let me give you what is not. Number one, it it does not mean to be spiritually deficient. It does not mean that. It does not mean to be spiritually deficient. Uh, uh, In other words, to be spiritually deficient is a curse, not a blessing. Uh, sometimes people have the idea, well, look, you know, he's going through a hard time. He's poor in spirit. He's not right with God. He's poor. That's not what it means. Being poor in spirit also does not mean to be physically deprived. In other words, uh, material property is no guarantee of holy conduct. The condition of this first, uh, uh, of this first beatitude is not poverty uh, of the pocketbook, but it is poverty of the heart. And there's a difference. It's not talking about anything material here. Uh, It's not talking about someone that is poor in spirit. It's someone that just has no money, someone that's poor, someone that's destitute, someone who's uh, just uh, uh, left it for themselves. And uh, in other words, sometimes people say, well, because I'm poor, I'm spiritual. That's not the case at all. You know, many times... uh, Many of the Catholic monks would do things like that. They would live in poverty because they thought that that was spiritual. They would beat themselves on the back because they thought that inflicting pain upon themselves was spiritual. I'm thinking, well, Jesus already took your pain. Why would you inflict pain on yourself? But they thought that that was spiritual. To, uh, so uh, to be poor in spirit does not mean to be spiritually deficient. It does not mean to be physically deprived. And it, thirdly, it does not mean to be outwardly debased. So what do you mean by that? F.B. Meyer put it this way. We sometimes act humbly because we are proud of a reputation of humility. (laughs) Isn't that true? So in other words, the outward... uh, Oh, you know. You know how he illustrated... Jesus Christ illustrated that when he said the Pharisees, they do things on the outside. They fast so that everybody can... They disfigure themselves so that everybody... Well, what's wrong with you? Oh, I'm fasting and I'm just going through a hard time. That's not being poor in spirit. You see, that is not being poor in spirit. It is not uh, outwardly debasing yourself. Uh, Sometimes people, they put themselves down so much that they gain so much attention. That's not poor in spirit. Okay? So, this is not being poor in spirit. It is not spiritually deficient. It is not physically deprived. It is not outwardly debased. But, let's ask the second question. What is being poor in spirit? That's a good question to ask. I think we need to answer that. Well, let's take the two words. The word poor uh, means literally this. To cower and cringe like a beggar. To cower and cringe like a beggar. Twice the word is rendered in the the Bible, beggar. That same word poor is rendered twice beggar. Uh, It is once, it is uh, translated beggarly in the Bible. So the word poor literally means this. The word poor means this, beggar. 
Okay? Now, let's, let, we got to keep going. There's two parts to that. There's the poor in spirit. So the poor mean, means what? Beggar. Oh, let's try this again. The poor means what? Beggar. beggar. Okay? So a blessed is the beggar, notice, wait, in spirit. So the word spirit connects to poor, uh, to the spiritual aspect of our life. Therefore, it is poverty in the spiritual area which is addressed in the first Beatitudes. Not the physical poverty, but the spiritual poverty. So poor in spirit means this. It means a complete absence of pride. A complete absence of self-assurance and self-reliance. It means a, a consciousness that we are nothing in the presence of God. In other words, it is this. It is a realization of our utter need before God. A beggar. Someone that says, I cannot be blessed except God bless me. That is a spiritual beggar. And the Bible says, blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, God is drawn to the beggar in spirit. And alternatively, God rejects those who think they are just fine. There's a difference between someone that says, I'm okay where I am. And there's a difference between someone that says, I really need God. God, I need your blessing in my life. God, I really need you. I can't live without you. That's a poor in spirit. John Jill put it this way in his commentary. He said this, All mankind is spiritually poor. They have nothing to eat that is fit and proper. He's talking in the spiritual sense. Nor any clothes to wear but rags. Nor, any, uh, nor are they able to purchase either. They have no money to buy with. They are in debt, owe 10,000 talents, and have nothing to pay. And in such a condition that they are not able to help themselves. He's describing this idea of being a spiritual beggar. That's what that means. So, it does not mean to be spiritually deficient, to be physically deprived, and to be outwardly debased, but it means to be a spiritual beggar seeking for the blessing of God, knowing that before God and before His presence, we are nothing. I want to ask this third question then. What is the opposite of poor in spirit? Well, being poor in spirit is completely contrary to our culture. Do we understand that? Being poor in spirit, being a spiritual beggar, is completely contrary to our culture. Much is said today about self-esteem and self-confidence. Uh, many will encourage people to believe in yourself. You, you, you've, I'm sure you've heard that even behind pulpits at times. Whether it was for uh, you in church or watching on TV or in the radio station, I'm sure... All of us have heard at some point or another, believe in yourself. That's not being poor in spirit. Therefore, you will reap the benefit of the opposite of being happy. You see, being poor in spirit brings the happiness of God. Being self-confident, being full of yourself, trusting in yourself, believing in yourself, having self-confidence, having self-esteem is the opposite of being poor in spirit. Martin Lord Joins wrote this, he says, Poor in spirit means a complete absence of pride, a complete absence of self-assurance, and of self-reliance. It means a consciousness that we are nothing in the presence of God. Does God pour out His blessing on those full of self-confidence and self-esteem, those who listen to their own hearts, those who follow their own dreams and believe in themselves? The answer is no. But isn't that what the world says? Believe in yourself. Follow your dream. Trust your heart that is not poor in spirit. You remember when Jesus Christ wrote to the church in Revelation 3.17, He says, Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. That's exactly what it is. That church got to the place where they were not poor in spirit. They thought, we don't need anything. We got everything we need. Uh, look, uh, and he says, look, you don't even realize that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked before God. You think you don't have no need of God. And that's a dangerous place to be. So we see the intent, the instruction, but number three, we see the importance. 
why, I want to ask myself this question, why is this verse first? Uh, everything in the Bible has a reason. And I believe there's a reason for this particular verse being first. Now he mentions this, he mentions, notice, the poor in spirit, they that mourn, the meek, they which hunger and thirst after righteousness, uh, the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemaker, they which are persecuted, uh, those that are reviled, uh, persecuted, uh, that say all manner of evil against you. Uh, he is list here in the Beatitude section, but the first one he mentions the poor in spirit. The instruction to be poor in spirit is the first one given because it is where it all begins. It reveals to us the importance of this first beatitude. Before we can have any spiritual progression in our lives, we have to declare ourselves bankrupt before God. We have to declare ourselves as, uh, uh, as beggars before God, saying, God, I can't do this without you. I, I, I can't live without you. I can't progress spiritually without you. I can't be what you want me to be without you. In other words, think about it this way. One cannot be saved unless he is first poor in spirit. Someone will never get to the place of salvation if they're not poor in spirit. If they don't realize their utter dependence upon God for salvation. Also, one cannot be discipled by Christ unless he becomes first poor in spirit. And we also understand that one cannot be blessed of God unless he is first poor in spirit. That's where it begins. And he begins at the most important place. Do you remember the uh, illustration that Jesus Christ was given to the religious people? He said this in Luke 18, uh, comparing the Pharisee with the publican. He says this, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves. There it is. The opposite of being poor in spirit. He's speaking to certain that trusted in themselves. Okay, so what are the people that trusted in themselves like? He says this. Two men were uh, up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not, uh, uh, notice, would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to the house justified rather than that other... The, uh, uh, for every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. There it is. Poor in spirit, and someone trusting in themselves. Do not buy the junk out there that says, trust in yourself. Last I check, our hearts is desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? Uh, there is no self-reliance there. Now, lest we misunderstand what I'm saying, I am not saying... If you just study the life of Christ, think about it for just a moment. Uh, was Christ poor in spirit? He prayed to God. He sought, the, remember in his prayer, prayer in the garden, he said, not my will, but thine be done. Uh, that's a perfect example of being poor in spirit. Can anybody stand here today and say, while well, Jesus Christ was a coward, uh, Jesus Christ uh, kind of was a timid, and he didn't voice his opinion, he didn't voice the truth. Oh no, far from the truth, he was poor in spirit, but he was absolutely confident in God. Amen. Why? Because he had the truth. And he says, look, I have the truth. And guess what? The truth is going to set you free. There was confidence there. The apostle Paul says, look, I came to you in weakness. I have no strength, no ability within myself. I came not to you with the wisdom of men, but I came to you in the power of God. And we could say, yes, Paul was poor in spirit because he said, out of all of the sinners in the world, I am chief. That's a poor in spirit. Paul. Can anybody stand in the presence of Paul and say, he's a coward? He's not confident. Actually, the opposite. You see, when you trust in yourself and you fail, there's nothing else to, to stand on. But when you trust in God, He's always there to stand on. So the importance of this beyond is because it's where it all begins. Didn't Jesus, uh, didn't God say in 1 Peter 5, 5, Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elders. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. God resists the proud. And think about it here. Uh, disciple, you want to be discipled by Christ. This is where it begins. 
be poor in spirit. Because if you have any ounce of pride in your life, if there's any ounce in yourself that says, I can do this, I can live this Christian life, I can trust in myself, and then you will never be discipled by Christ. You'll never be what Christ wants you to be. This is where it begins. You say, well, why am I not progressing spiritually? Because God is resisting you. That's why you can't progress. It begins here. Let's go to Genesis chapter 32. We'll be done here to kind of illustrate this truth. In Genesis chapter 32, we have a perfect picture of what a spiritual beggar is. Notice Genesis chapter 32. And we'll begin reading in verse 24, but as soon as you get the setting here, uh, Jacob, the last time he saw Esau, Esau said that he was going to kill him. So Jacob fled for his life. Uh, ever since then, he got married. He got two wives. Not recommended. He's got plenty of kids. And he's making his way back to Esau. And uh, he's about to meet Esau. And so he's afraid for his life. So what he does is he sends gifts to Esau. Uh, the word Jacob means conniver, trickster. That's the kind of life that he led. And as he's preparing to meet Esau, he sends, uh, uh, first of all, some gifts. He sends, <laughs> he sends the wife and the children before him. I mean, that's really manly right there. And he says, all right, let's uh, prepare the way. And he's trying to appease Esau. He's about to meet him, and he knows he doesn't have a great, great relationship with him. And up to this point, everything that Jacob has done has been of self-will, has been of self-confidence. Him and Laban were perfect for each other. They connived and tricked each other all of that time. And now Jacob is left. And notice here in verse 24, And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. I want you to stop here right here because understand this. Jacob is about to meet Esau. He stays back. He's left alone. Everybody has been sent out in front of him. He's kind of the last buffer uh, in case anything else happens in front of him. He's left alone. And now notice here, and we know this is an encounter with God because he says later that I have seen God face to face. So he knew who he's wrestling against. And so we see that this uh, man jumps him. Uh, notice until the breaking of the day. Notice, and when he saw that he uh, prevailed not. So think about it. Here's the picture. God is wrestling with Jacob and Jacob is winning. That's what it says. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, notice, he touched the hollow of his thigh. So you see, God was not winning, uh, winning against Jacob, and so God touches his thigh, and his thigh was out of joint. Now note what happens. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Notice verse 26. And he said, let me go. Now who's the he? That's God. He says to Jacob, let me go. For the day breaketh. And he said, that's Jacob. Get this. Here it is, the beggar in spirit. I will not let thee go except thou bless me. You see, that's the blessing. Do you see here, Jacob, they're wrestling together. And, and, and by the way, a wrestling match, I'm used to wrestling match because I have three brothers and it was almost on a daily basis. We wrestled with each other. And uh, wrestling is about this. Wrestling match is about control. Who's going to control the other? Who's going to pin the other one down? Who is going to tap out? Okay, that's the goal. Control the adversary. Okay, the brother. So God is not winning, and so God cripples Jacob. So Jacob gets to the place where now he's begging. Now he says, oh, wait a minute. If I meet Esau, I can't run away from him because I'm crippled. If I meet Esau, I'm unable to fight against him. And I am utterly now dependent. I, am, I can't do anything. I am weak now. And what he does, he turns to God. And you see, he grabs hold of God and he's not going to let him go. That's a beggar. You see, he's begging. He says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. That's what a beggar is. A beggar stands on the street corner and as someone passes, he says, please, money, please, money. And a beggar is someone that begs and begs and begs. Why? Because they want that money. And here Jacob does the same thing with God. He says, I beg you, please, I cannot allow you to leave until you bless me. That is a poor in spirit. You see, well, it was physical. It was physical to illustrate for us a spiritual truth. As we continue, the Bible says, in verse 27, he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and has prevailed. Jacob lost. Well, that's what it looks on the surface. He was crippled. Yes, he lost. But God looks at Jacob 
after Jacob begged him and says, I can't let you go until you bless me. And that's when God says, you won. You see, that is poor in spirit. A spiritual beggar. He goes on to say, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel, for as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Whereof uh, is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have noticed seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. You see, Jacob, before that meeting with God, he was self-sufficient. Everything up to this point, even sending the, the gifts ahead of him, even sending the wives and the children ahead of him, was all his plan, was all his scheme, was all him trusting in himself. And now for the first time in his life, he's relying upon God. And God says, now Jacob, you've won. Now, Jacob, you have power with God and with men. Now, Jacob realizes, now my life is preserved. But you're a cripple, Jacob. Yes, but I'm in poor in spirit. You see, this is why this is so important. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Do you notice the present tense? Theirs is the kingdom of God. Now, there's many things we can say about the kingdom of God, but we know what the kingdom of God is going to be like during the millennial reign of Christ. It's going to be a perfect kingdom. And it's going to come where Jesus Christ is literally going to come on earth and rule and reign for a thousand years. It's literally going to happen. But he says, for you, Christian, if you are poor in spirit, the kingdom of God is yours now. You see, this unlocks a truth for the life of the Christian. Happy is the spiritual beggar. As Jacob, who holds on to God and says, God, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. It's time in our lives, if we're going to allow ourselves to be discipled by Christ, to become spiritual beggars and to say, God, I need you. There's no self-esteem, no self-confidence. There's nothing in my life that I can do. There's nothing in my life that I have the ability to do to please you. But I want your favor. I want your blessing. I want to be happy. Which again, what is happiness? It is not connected to the circumstances. It's beyond the circumstances. And that's where it begins. God gives grace to the humble as he sowed Jacob. But you know what he does? He resists the proud. So the intent of this verse is for us to be happy. God wants to, his favor to be upon us, his blessing to be, to, to be upon our lives. And the only way to do that is for us to be spiritual beggars, to be poor in spirit, to not be self-sufficient, but to be totally dependent upon God and for his enablement for us to live the Christian life and then we have a promise now. Theirs is the kingdom of God. So, we cannot study all the other Beatitudes until we settle the first one. And that's something that we have to settle tonight. So, here's the first lesson in the school of Christ. This is the first lesson of discipleship as Jesus Christ is discipling his disciples whether the 12 or the 70 blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven